Hello film lovers, I'm Jose and this is 365 movies in 365 days and this is The Plague Dogs. So I have a question for you guys. At what age did you realize that animals had emotions and feelings like people? Were you like 8, 10? Maybe you haven't realized that yet. I didn't grow up in a family with a lot of animals or pets of any kind other than chickens. If you call chickens a pet, they were kind of mean, so you didn't really get near them. Now, for me to discover that animals had emotions and feelings, I had to go through some of the worst pain ever in my life. So it didn't come easy to figure this out. One of the worst memories in my life happened when I was seven. I had my appendix taken out when it burst in the middle of the night. It was the worst pain I have ever felt. And 32 years later, I can still feel it. My mom said that she thought I was going to die because she didn't know what was going on. She had never been through this, at least that she recalled. And I'm assuming that they have appendix bursting in Mexico, but maybe she wasn't thinking. She was just worried about seeing her son, you know, in pain, you know, bent over, screaming and crying. I can imagine if my grandmother was still alive at that time, she probably would have thought the devil was in me. But I guess that's a story for a different day. Off to the hospital I went, and on to the road of recovery. Now, while I was at the hospital, I got a stuffed toy named Rabbit. And guess what? He was a blue rabbit. Sure, maybe I was too old for this stuffed toy business, but I didn't care because I clung on to this bunny because at that age, I learned a really valuable lesson. We all die. Yeah, I was a pretty grown-up kid. At night, I would hold on to that bunny as tight as I could because I didn't ever want to feel that pain ever again. I remember a lot of things about that hospital stay. I remember playing the game Candyland for the first time and trying to walk without the crushing pain that I was feeling. I remember the stitching on my stomach breaking open and the doctors just letting it heal instead of trying to close it back up because we were at a, well, at a horrible hospital. Well, it left a terrible scar on my stomach that I still see. It's kind of disgusting. But it was in the middle of all that pain that my bond with my rabbit grew. I couldn't go anywhere without him. He was everything to me. For the next following couple of years, I carried that rabbit everywhere. I would carry him on trips, to doctor offices, to family events. He was everything. He was my best friend. And as a kid who didn't have friends growing up, because I was terribly shy and I was kind of like over people already, he was it. But of course, as time went on, he started to lose an eye and then a foot. His stains became harder and harder to take out. And then one day he was just simply gone. I didn't understand why he had to go. I mean, he was just a toy. But my mom sat me down and tried her best to explain it to me. She said there comes a point in which all animals have to go, even toys. Now, I had never at that age understood the concept of death. Death wasn't something that I had come across. And in fact, at, even at the age of 40 now, I still haven't really come across death too much. I've had it come to me and I've met it face to face, but not overwhelmingly like a lot of people. So my mom tried the best to try to explain to me why that rabbit had to go. And she said, pain like that, which the rabbit was having, because he was missing an eyeball and a foot, and he was beyond dirty, was something that animals felt, even the ones that are made out of stuffing. Just like my appendix, she said. Remember how much that hurt you? Well, animals feel that too. And even the best animals sometimes have to go. Because sometimes the best thing to do is to let them go. And that applies to stuffed rabbits too. Animals die, she said. Now, my mind had never really put two and two together, but it made sense to me. They do have to die, right? If we die, they die. I guess I had never heard it out loud, but at that moment, it became very, very clear. I would look at animals from that moment on in the eye, trying to understand how they felt. Were they scared? Were they happy? Were they lonely? Were they bored? Or curious about me like I was about them? Our bonds with animals are deep, but so is our ability to torture them, to open them up, to dissect them, to injure 
to hurt and to kill them all in the name of knowledge. Animals are our friends. They are members of our family. And like any member of our family, we hurt them. We read the stories in newspapers, see it on the internet, and hear it from friends and family. People torturing and abusing animals. The same animals that put their trust in us. But not everything is a dark, hellish place. There are many people who devote their whole lives to improving those of animals. People who understand that there's a balance between us and everything else on this planet. There are many times I still wish that I had my rabbit. I'm a 40-year-old man who doesn't understand the world many times. Our ability to be cruel and unjust to our fellow man makes my mind not want to know what they do to animals. Because, I mean, if we can hurt and maim and kill people, can you imagine what we do to animals sometimes? This story is about two dogs that escape from a research lab in an attempt to try to find freedom. It has a theme of not only friendship, but of animal cruelty. It is in friendship, no matter how cruel that this world is, that we find hope. Hope that the pain will end. Hope that we are not all doomed. And hope that better days are coming. Now, some basics on today's story. Today's story was first released in 1982. It is an adult animated adventure. It is based on the 1977 novel by Richard Adams. And it was written and directed by Martin Rosen. And it starred John Hurt, Christopher Benjamin, and James Boland. And it was released on October 21st, 1982 in the UK and December 16, 1983 in the US. And now our story. Our story starts as we watch a dog in a water tank try his best to keep his head above the water. It is a fight that he slowly loses and sinks to the bottom of the pool. But he is saved. Pull out the water by men in white coats. We hear the men talk about tests and we know we are in a lab. We travel to a kennel full of dogs as they are being fed. However, one of the dogs is dead. It is picked up with a shovel, just like trash. The other dogs go quiet. The man feeding the dogs is in a rush, and the dog that almost drowned is being fed. The dog's name is Ralph, and Ralph is a sour dog, cynical, and distrusting of men in the white coats. Snitter, his neighbor, gets into Ralph's pen by going under the wire fence between the two fences. Ralph asks Sinner, why? Why are they testing on him? He's not a bad dog. But Snitter doesn't answer. And in anger, he strikes the cage, only to see that the gate opens. Snitter, who has a cap taped to his head, wants to leave. But Ralph sees his pen as a safe place. But Snitter convinces Rolf to leave. They walk through the hallways. They enter a room full of rats in cages, then a room full of monkeys with probes on their heads, then rabbits with only their heads sticking out from boxes. They can't find a way out. Snitter goes into a slot in the wall that says incinerator. They can smell burnt flesh, but also fresh air. Rolf isn't sure about going inside, but goes in with Snitter when he hears someone coming. Once inside, they are not able to find a way out, and so they lay down, and Snitter has a dream. He can hear his master coming, so he jumps a gate. The master's on the other side of the road, and so he goes into the road to meet him, but a truck comes, and in an act to save his dog, Snitter's master pushes him out of the way, and his master is hit and killed by the truck. The last thing Snitter dreams of is hearing a woman blame him for the death of his master. Snitter knows they need to find a way out, but Rolf, who's older, just wants to rest. 
And then the dog who was dead earlier is thrown in there with them. And they know what's about to happen. The two try their best to find a way out and they finally find an air vent. And just as we see a man turn on the gas, the dogs are frantically trying to get out. It's tenseful, but they make it out just in time before the fire turns on. At first the dogs are happy, but then they realize that it's going to be much harder than they thought out in the open, out with freedom. They need to find a master. And so they go through a gate that's open, out into the world. But life out in the open is not what Snitter remembers. Not at all. Getting hungry, Ralph says to Snitter that they are not going to die. And if they're not to die, then they need to turn into real animals. But they haven't found any food. And the hunger gets worse. As a buzzer flies overhead, Snitter says, Have you ever thought, Ralph, that we won't need food when we're dead? Or names for that matter? I wonder who the buzzards will like best, you or me? Finally, they kill a sheep to stay alive. But the fight to kill the sheep was hard on Ralph. Then it starts raining. Then they find a cave and they meet the Todd, a fox. The fox says he will help them stay alive if they will share in the food. And so they agree. But the Todd also tells them about a place, the dark. It is the place you go when you stop running. Now. We know what he means. He's talking about death, isn't he? Isn't that where we go when we're done running? When the run is done. It has been 12 days since they escaped. And Snedder loses the cap off his head. And we see a hole in his head. We know what they have been doing to him in that lab. They were doing operations on him. After the cap falls off, he says, the flies in my head, they keep buzzing. Men with hunting dogs and guns come. The local media gets a hold of the story as more stories about the dogs start to spread. Questions are also starting to spread and asked about the lab and what kind of testing was being done on the animals. Then. Snitter kills a local hunter by mistake. To Snitter, the man who was calling him reminded him of his master. His mind couldn't tell them apart. In a quick moment, as he tries to climb onto the hunter, he presses the shotgun the hunter is holding and shoots him in the face. Snitter tries to explain to Ralph what happened. I was, I was coming back. And all the grass and stones in my head were very loud. It was kind of humming, like a strong wind. And I, I was on the road, like last time. He called me and smiled, and I went to him. And everything smashed into pieces. I smashed it like I did the other time. It all comes from me, Ralph, out of my head. I killed that man like I killed my master. That's why we're here now, like this. We'll be punished, Ralph. Ralph replies, they can't do anything worse than they've already done. Everything bad comes out of my head, don't you see? Perhaps dying, even dying doesn't stop it, says Snitter. They'll shoot you, Ralph. And when they come with guns, the noise breaks the world to bits. News that the dogs might have the plague starts to spread. And so the army is called out to find the dogs. Even with the help from the fox, Things start to look a little rough. When another hunter falls off a cliff while hunting the dogs, they eat him, leaving just the corpse behind. A helicopter flying over sees the body, and rumors, and a call to end the reign of terror over these man-eating dogs is called out. The dogs are cornered, but the fox distracts the troopers so the two dogs can get away. 
and before he is killed, he reminds them, whatever happens, don't stop. Remember, keep moving, the fox says. The dogs make it onto a train and make it to a coastal village, but are quickly spotted, chased to a coastline as armed troopers close in to shoot the dogs. Snitter looks out into the water and says that he sees an island. He starts to swim and Ralph joins him as the men start to shoot the dogs, but they miss. As they swim, a mist starts to cover the dogs, swimming towards an island that only Snitter sees. He starts to lose hope though. Hope is in short supply. And he stops going towards the island. And Snitter tells Ralph, I can't swim anymore, Ralph. And Ralph replies, we must be near the island. If there is any island, Ralph, and Snedder has lost all hope. Then Ralph says, there, there is, can't you see it? Our island. And Ralph urges Snedder not to lose hope. Just stay with me. I'll get you there. The dogs swim into the mist deeper. And all we see is the mist. And an island. Far away. So what happened to the dogs? Did they make it to the island? Did they drown? Or did something else happen to them? It is my personal belief that the fog is a way to symbolize that the troopers did get the dogs with the bullets. And they are in that dark place that the fox talked about. But they just don't know it. And they're swimming out to this island, this magical island in which they will not feel any pain anymore. And maybe that's just my hope that that's what actually happened to them. In the original novel, they get rescued at the last moment. But that wasn't the original story that was told by Adams. In his book, they didn't make it. But the publisher didn't like that. He thought, that's a little dark, so he changed it. I remember the first time I watched this movie, I cried. Oh boy, did I cry. I mean, how can you not help but cry? I mean, it's an impactful story, right? These dogs escape from one torture and then go into another torture and then you're left wondering what happens to them. There's no clear-cut, you know, typical Hollywood ending where you know that the outcome is safe or good or bad. It's left very ambiguous as to what could really have happened to them. It's not everybody's cup of tea, I know. But it's an important film. Now, is it a film that I would show my children? I don't have any children. But even if I did, hell no would I show this to them. Under no circumstances. This is, yes, it's animated, but under no circumstances would I ever show this to them. And yet, I think it's an important thing to show them. I know, maybe I'm being cruel. But there does come a point where children need to understand that death impacts us all. It really does. It's a little bit of backstory on the plague dogs. After the success of Watership Down, which was also written and directed by Rosen, he decided to adapt another book by Adams. This time it was the plague dogs. This was Adams' third novel. Now Adams did say that there is no such place as this animal research laboratory because in reality laboratory places wouldn't have all these different types of animals however all the different types of experimentation that was happening on the animals is things that is happening out there not only back when it was written in the late 70s but it continues to happen today and for what purpose i'm not sure while the release of the movie is given as december 16th 1983 this was only for a test screening that was done in Washington State. It wouldn't be until January 9th, 1985 that it would finally be given a limited release. And that's when most critics reviewed it. It was in 1985, not 1983. 
It currently has a 60% on Rotten Tomatoes with only five reviews, but the audience score is 90%. And I'm guessing that it would have a higher score on Rotten Tomatoes if it had more reviews, but with only five, it's going to have a lower rating. Now, there are two different versions of the film. The original release, which is 103 minutes, and the shorter U.S. version, which comes in at 86 minutes. For a very long time, the only version you could find was the shorter 86-minute version. Recently, it was finally released on Blu-ray, and it comes with both versions. So, should you watch this movie? Yes, watch it. And then think about the themes afterwards. Should we be testing on animals? Is the pain and suffering of these animals teaching us anything? How do you feel about this? Ask yourself these questions. Ask your children these questions. Ask the person next to you these questions. And how would you feel if you were an animal and suffering was a day-to-day thing for you? How would you feel? Again, more questions to ask yourself. I personally find it absolutely horrible. I think back at my rabbit, and if he was real, would he like that? I don't think so. Don't think so at all. The art in this movie is beautiful to watch, to see. It's hand-drawn. There isn't any rotoscope or computer animation to help out. It's an old-fashioned hand-drawn movie, and it's beautiful. And yes, the scenes are dark. But not everything has to be sunshine and roses. Because you know as much as I do that life is not like that. But friendships are just as important. And I think that's one of the other things that draws me to this movie. Is its themes about friendship. There are two dogs that have enormous odds that they have to overcome to try to find that freedom, that peace of mind. But they're only going to do it if they stick together. And they do. They trust each other. Even if they have different personalities and they see things in different ways, they stick together. And I think that's something we can think about in our own personal lives and in terms of society as a whole. We're all different. But even if we are different, we can get there. We can be more if we just stick together. I know sometimes it can seem overwhelming to try to agree with somebody who sees the world differently from you. Maybe you're that snout, you know, rough dog. And maybe the person next to you seems chipper and hopeful. And maybe you guys think, this isn't going to work. We can't see eye to eye. But trust me, we all want the same things, don't we? So what came after this? Well, John Hurt would go on to do King Lear in 1983. And so would James Bolin, but he would do another Shakespeare play in 1983, but he would do Macbeth instead. Christopher Benjamin, who played Ralph, wouldn't be seen on American screens again until 2016 with The Legend of Tarzan. And so what came out that same week that The Plague Dogs came out originally in the UK? Well, First Blood, the first of the Rambo movies, also came out that same week, as did Halloween 3. Now, as for the 1985 minor release, it was up against a slasher movie that has been mostly forgotten by most people called Mulator. And that's actually a pretty good movie if you like slashers. As for the director, he really didn't direct much after this. With such a failure that the Plague Dogs really was, he never really directed much after this, unfortunately. I really want to thank you for joining me on today's show. And remember... You can follow us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or any place you get your podcasting feed. You can also follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and on Facebook. And thank you so much for joining me. Again, today's movie was The Plague Dogs, and you can find it on Blu-ray. And we will have the links where you can find it in the show notes. Thank you so much, and until next time, have a great day.